what we'll do is just start off with a, a somewhat more global look about what's going on now, touch base here and there, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Brian Dickey. Brian? Thank you, Robert. Can everybody hear me, first of all? Yeah. If I start to get a bit um, quiet, do let me know. I won't be offended. Um, and if you can't understand my accent, that's tough. <laughs> um, uh, as Rob said, the, the focus today really is on respiratory management, um, except for me. I've been left to deal with everything else. And there's a lot of stuff going on, um, far too much for me to get through in uh, 20 minutes. So I'm just going to focus on two particular um, questions. Um, one of which is, what causes ALS? That's a question we've been asking for decades. And the second question is, can we mimic in the patient, what, in the lab, sorry, what's actually going on in the real world of the patient? So to answer, or to address the first question, a um, bit of audience participation, first of all. Um, hands up who's seen the film Sliding Doors? Yep, quite a few. Any of the guys? Yeah, maybe the occasional one, yeah. It's a classic chick flick. For those of you who haven't seen it, it, uh, oh, it stars the lovely Gwyneth Paltrow. And basically, it's two stories in one, two films in one. In the first film, she's running to try and get on the London Underground train, and she gets on just before the doors close. And in the second version of the film, she's running for the train, the doors close just before she gets there, and she has to wait for the next train to come along. And that one event sends her life off. This uh, talking of life, this thing seems to have a, a life of its own. Um, that one event sends her life off in two completely different directions. And you know, when you're, you're given a diagnosis of ALS, um, it's not unusual to say, well, why me? Why did I get this disease? And it's often followed up by, well, what was the thing that gave me this disease? And to be honest, if there was a sliding doors moment, a single moment, we'd have found it a long, long time ago. ALS, by and large, is what we call a, a multifactorial disease. There's going to be lots of different um, events occurring in combination over a long period that finally causes the disease to manifest. And the analogy I often use is like a, a set of balancing scales, like the scales of justice. And something has to tilt the balance in favor of the disease occurring. So there may be, for example, some genetic factors, what we call susceptibility genes, that may predispose people to developing the disease. And indeed, a lot of research in recent years has started to identify some of these. But they're really no more than grains of sand on the scales. So you could be born with a particular susceptibility gene. It, a grain of sand is sitting there on the scales, but the scales don't move. It's not enough to cause the disease. Maybe you've been a little bit more unfortunate and you've inherited a susceptibility gene from your father, one from your mother. They're sitting there on the scales. The scales still don't move. So we have to start looking at maybe environmental factors. Um, now, we know that age is a risk factor. The older you are, the more likely you are to develop the disease. We know that gender is involved, that males develop the disease slightly more often than females. The ratio is about three to two. Beyond that, all the epidemiological research that's been done into people's lifestyles, their occupations, etc., has been a little bit vague. We haven't been able to really nail down any definitive environmental causes of MND. So people have looked at diet, exposure to chemicals, um, electromagnetic fields, electric shock, athleticism, of course, is one that uh, Professor Shaw here has a particular interest in. Military service, of course, very uh, um, relevant in the United States. Infections. But none of these are definitive causes of the disease. They're probably all like grains of sand. So for example, um, maybe when you were, your, sick, your mother was six months pregnant with you, she caught a cold, could be a grain of sand on the scales. You were dropped on your head as a baby, could be another grain of sand on the scales. Between the ages of five and 10, you lived in the countryside and Farmer Giles was chucking his DDT over the crops every summer, could be another grain of sand. You were very sporty and athletic at high school, 
you played baseball, rugby, another grain of sand. You went off to university, you did the complete opposite. You drank like a fish, smoked like a chimney, didn't get out of bed till two o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe that was just me, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, it's, the combina it's potentially the combination of all these disparate and apparently unconnected events that after several decades may finally tilt the balance in favor of the disease occurring. Of course, sometimes, in five to 10% of cases, it's a little bit clearer than that because sometimes the disease does run in families. And in this case, there's definitely a very strong genetic factor involved. Um, and it's more like a weight, a larger weight on the scales. Given enough time, the chances are the scales will tilt. It doesn't always happen, but nearly always happens. Now, the key breakthrough was made. It actually involved um, researchers at Northwestern University um, back in 1993 when a genetic mutation, a genetic factor was involved um, in some families, but it wasn't present in the rest of the general population, rather appropriately because of what it does called the SOD1 gene. I'm not going to go into the biochemistry of SOD1. Um, the important thing is that since that discovery, there's been a lot of additional advances made. Um, MND, motor neuron disease, ALS, was first characterized in the 1860s by a French neurologist called uh, Charcot. So it took about 125 years between the disease being given a name to identify a definitive cause of the disease in the 1990s. You can then see it took about um, 13 years to identify the second cause two years to identify the third cause, one year to identify the fourth cause, and since then, we've been identifying new causes uh, fairly frequently. In fact, this year, it's been quite a, a quiet one for new gene discoveries with just one new gene um, identified, and um, people will be hearing more about that at the International Symposium this week. But um, the point is that the pace, this illustrates just how the pace of research is building up from going from 125 years knowing nothing to identifying new causes of familial MND on a fairly regular basis. Now, of course, there is another side of the scales as well. Just as there are bad genes that can cause the disease, so we're starting to think, well, maybe there are other good genes that they might not stop the disease from happening, but maybe they slow down the progression of the disease. One of the most common questions I'm asked over in Britain is, Stephen Hawking, why has he lived for over 40 years with MND? And my pet theory is, well, there's something in his genetic makeup that is pushing back against the disease. It hasn't stopped it from happening, but it's meant it's progressing very slowly. So researchers are starting to turn their attention to this other side of the scales here um, to try and identify, well, what are the factors that may actually be different in people who live for 5, 10, 15 years with ALS compared to those that develop it much more quickly. Of course, the point of trying to identify these definitive causes of MND is, of ALS, it gives you a starting point. In the past, all we had was the end point, dead and dying motor neurons. If we have a starting point, we can start to actually follow the path of how motor neurons start to get sick and start to degenerate. Um, Tipu Sadiq at Northwestern often uh, uses the phrase the molecular funnel. And um, in this slide, you can see there's almost a sort of funneling effect. You've got lots of different identified causes of familial MND. And his idea is that they all come together into one final common pathway. The way a motor neuron finally dies in motor neuron disease and ALS um, will have a lot of commonality, no matter what the original cause of the disease is. The analogy I use is very similar to that, but I think of it more like a river flowing out to the sea. And what we want to do is find out, well, where do the tributaries meet? What are those common pathways that determine life or death for a motor neuron? Because if we can identify that, those, you've got a strategy to try and dam the river at that point, which hopefully, if you develop a treatment based on that strategy, will have the greatest effect on the largest number of cases of ALS. But in reality, I'm afraid that's all a little bit oversimplistic. Um, 
I think it's a little bit more like the London Underground. And for those of you who have ever tried to negotiate the London Underground, <laughs> it can be a bit of a challenge. But on the London Underground, you'll notice here's the River Thames here, flowing through the center of London, but there's actually very few lines go south of the river. And so with ALS, the chances are that it's not just one pathway, there's probably a limited number of final biochemical pathways that um, cause the motor neurons to die. But of course, north of the river here, we've got loads and loads of different starting points. And right in the middle, we've just got this interconnected mesh of different lines meeting up and going off in different directions. And this is going to be one of the challenges for treating ALS, is how do we, how do we deal with this? How do we stop this? Um, there was lots of worry when the Olympics were on in London in the summer about how, um, whether they'd be disrupted. And you know, if I wanted to um, disrupt the London Underground, I'd say, well, where would I leave my suspicious looking packages? Well, maybe I'd leave one in Euston Station here and one in Liverpool Street Station and one down in Victoria Station, where the lines all meet. And that's probably what we're looking at in the treatment of ALS in the vast majority of cases is no one treatment working but a combination therapy attacking the disease in different places at different stages. Hope that makes sense. So moving on to the second question, well, can we mimic in the lab what's going on in the patient? Well, you know, there's a couple of ways you can, you can do that. You can look at the whole organism and we can use animal models to try and look at the disease, or you can try and break everything down into its individual component parts. And there's no perfect model of ALS at the moment, um, but each model has its own uses. And there's a quite a bewildering variety of different models. You can go from the very reductionist approach of looking at motor neurons grown in a dish um, through to the very rudimentary organisms like nematode worms which contain motor neurons that connect with muscles. So you've actually got the connectivity there. Um, you can work your way up the evolutionary ladder from invertebrates through to vertebrates. So they've got a backbone now, a bit like the human spinal cord, um, all the way up to the mammalian models, the rats and the mice. And I'm just gonna give a, a couple of examples of um, some of the work that the MND Association has been funding using um, two particular models. So I'm gonna talk about um, motor neurons that are derived from skin cells from patients. It's a stem cell procedure. And also I'm gonna talk about these little chaps, the zebrafish. So um, I'm sure you've read a lot. You can't pick up a newspaper or a magazine these days without reading about how stem cells are going to revolutionize our lives. Well, it seems to take a little longer than um, the newspapers thought it would take, but there's some very amazing advances going on in stem cell research. And one of the, the major ones just in the past three or four years has been the ability to take skin cells from somebody with a familial form of motor neuron disease, and you can give these cells almost like a memory wipe so they forget what they are. They forget their skin cells. And when that happens, they start to revert to something that looks and acts a little bit like an embryonic stem cell. And stem cells are basically cells that haven't decided what they want to be when they grow up. So you can give them a little bit of careers guidance. And if you know the right chemical processes, you can turn them into any type of cell in the body. And of course, in ALS, what we are interested in is turning these guys into motor neurons, the cells that degenerate in, in ALS, but also we can turn them into these support cells that are found in the brain called astrocytes. Astrocytes outnumber nerve cells in the brain by about 100 to 1, and normally they play a very nurturing role. But there's increasing evidence in ALS that they're a little bit like the wind that fans the flames of the forest fire. They can dictate how quickly the disease spreads throughout the central nervous system. So we've been funding a project. Um, it's an international project involving Edinburgh University, King's College London, and Columbia University in New York that are taking advantage of this, what I call cellular alchemy, being able to turn one type of cell in the body into a completely different one. Now, just over five years ago, if I'd been here, standing up here telling you about this, the 
guys in white coats would have carted me away because this would just have seemed complete science fiction. However, we does look like we can do it. We can turn these skin cells into things that look like motor neurons. Um, they act like motor neurons. Motor neurons, of course, conduct electrical signals. They respond to chemical neurotransmitter messengers, and these cells do as well. Um, but, so we've got these human motor neurons in the dish with a human cause of ALS in them. Do they start to develop ALS-like symptoms? Do we actually see them starting to act like motor neurons do in the spinal cord of patients? And here's an example of um, a motor neuron from post-mortem spinal cord tissue. And you can see these big blobs of gunge, these so-called protein aggregates that are building up, that are a classic pathological hallmark of ALS. So do our motor neurons, our human motor neurons in the dish do the same? Well. Um, the answer is yes, they do appear to, and this doesn't look like a very exciting um, picture, but I'll talk you through it. On this column here, what we have are uh, some protein that's been taken from these skin cells that have been turned into motor neurons from somebody with a familial form of MND, one of these TDP43 mutations. And on the right-hand side, we have one from somebody who doesn't have motor neuron disease. And first thing you can see is that this TDP43 protein, this classic hallmark of ALS, there's more of it produced in the ALS patient, but this is the key bit. This detergent-resistant TDP43, there's more of this stuff, and this, stu this is the stuff that is actually starting to aggregate, starting to gunge up within the cell. So certainly it looks like these motor neurons that come from a patient are actually mimicking what's going on in the real world. And indeed, what the, the Edinburgh group found was that the motor neurons actually start to die off faster if they've got the TDP43 mutation than if they don't. And if you have a difference, that gives you something that you can measure, something you can try and stop from happening by testing drugs. Um, now, that was um, published um, back in the spring, and more recently, another group, a uh, uh, collaboration between Kyoto University and the University of California, has managed to replicate a lot of these results. And I've just pointed out this gentleman's name, because um, I, I spoke about this at uh, the AGM of my charity back in September, and at the time I said, if I was a betting man, I would go down the bookmakers and I would put a large amount of money on this chap to win a Nobel Prize in the next few years. And two weeks later, he won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and he won the Nobel Prize for being the person who actually first worked out how you could turn one type of cell in the body into another. Um, so what this group have done is they've been looking at ALS, once again using patient skin cells, and they've managed to replicate a lot of the results of the Edinburgh group. Um, they didn't find the, um, the cells died much quicker, but you can certainly see they did find that the, the cells were more stunted and shriveled up and definitely a, a lot less healthier. But what they also have started to do is a uh, kind of rudimentary, very early screen of a number of drugs to see if they could reduce the amount of this protein, this TDP43 protein that gunges up within neurons. And yes, they started to identify one or two drugs that do seem to reduce that. So this is a um, very early stage, needs to be replicated in, in other labs, but certainly um, provides hope for the future. And of course, what we want to do is be able to grow these cells consistently to a standardized fashion so that we can test not just a handful of drugs, but thousands tens of thousands of different compounds. And if it keeps the human motor neuron, or the cause of human motor neuron disease alive in the dish, no guarantees, but at least shortens the odds, it might actually work in the patient as well. And it gives confidence to drug companies that they will invest in the millions and millions of dollars that are needed to take things from the lab through to the clinic. So, you know, the whole idea is that we can, um, use robots in the future to screen, do something called high throughput screening, test thousands, hundreds of thousands of compounds.
Um, just to move on now to um, another model that uh, I think is, uh, is really neat. Uh, it's work that's actually being done by colleagues of uh, Pam Shaw's in Sheffield, is using a zebrafish model of ALS. And this is actually a fish's eye view of the um, unit at the University of Sheffield. Um, they house something like 80,000 zebrafish there, um, looking at a variety of diseases, including ALS. Now, what they have developed is a zebrafish that contains a human familial ALS gene. This time it's called the SOD1 gene. Um, but it's not as simple as that. These are quite freaky fish because they actually contain another gene as well. And this gene doesn't come from humans. It comes from a type of coral, a type of coral that glows in the dark. And um, I can't go into the detail of all the um, genetic jiggery-pokery that goes on, but basically when these um, fish become, their cells start to become metabolically stressed, they become a little bit sick, the cells start to glow in the dark. And you can see here, even in a very young larval zebrafish, that some of the cells are becoming stressed. And where are they? They're in the brain and they're in the spinal cord. And we can zoom in on them and actually look at individual nerve cells starting to become sick at a very, very early stage in the life of this fish. So the great thing is that you can actually measure the amount of glow that's coming off of these fish. You can put drugs in with the fish and if it reduces the amount of glow, it provides an indicator that it's actually helping to protect the cells. And here's just an example. Um, here's the amount of glow without any drug. And here's the reduction with a drug, a drug I'm sure many of you are familiar with, Rilazole or Rilatec, the only currently available licensed treatment for ALS. So this is, this is great. I mean, this is what we call a positive control, proof of principle that the drug that has an effect in patients is actually having the desired effect in the fish as well. Now these are just larval fish, so they're not really doing very much. But you can then move on and look at the adult fish. And as the fish get older, they actually start to develop definitive symptoms of ALS. Um, and the way you can do that, you can show that, is you put the fish in something called a swim tank. So there's the fish there. Um, and basically, you're just pumping water through this tube. And you can control how strong the current is, and you can change the current with time. And of course, fish like swimming against the current. But eventually, fish get tired as well. They get fatigued. And so eventually, they think, oh, I've had enough of this. And they float down to the back, to the mesh at the back here. And you can see that can be picked up on a graph. With the sod one fish, the ones that develop ALS, they fatigue, they tire much, much faster. And once again, we have a difference here. So the question is, can we use drugs to actually see if we can turn this sod one fish into something that's more like a normal zebrafish. Now that's very much work in progress. Um, Dr. Ramesh, who's doing the work on this, is screening at the moment about two and a half thousand compounds and getting his first couple of hits. So I've, I know I've gone well over my time, so I'm just gonna finish with this one last slide. Um, this shows the number of scientific and medical research papers in ALS since just after the war, the red line here. And you can see that for many, many years, for decades, there really wasn't a lot going on in ALS research. But more recently, it started to rise, and it started to rise almost exponentially. And that can only be a good thing. I've added a couple of other rare neurological diseases, Huntington's and progressive supranuclear palsy, in for comparison. So you can see that there's more research going on into neurodegenerative disease than ever before. But there's something about ALS that really does seem to have caught the imagination and the attention of the international research community. And that can only be a good thing, because the more people we have working on our disease, the sooner we'll get the answers to the questions we're looking for. So thank you very much. What I'd like to do is uh, hold questions until the end for our question and answer session.